Oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> very, good. very happy to have Cliff John to tell us about generalized symmetry in dynamical gravity. Cool. So, uh, first, uh, thank you very much for the invitation to speak here today. It's, as usual, uh, wonderful to be visiting you. So, today I'm going to be telling you about uh, the topic of generalized symmetry in the context of gravity. This is work with uh, my collaborators, uh, Ira Rothstein, together with uh, my many students, Maria Derrida, Juni Kim, Vinicius Novoa, and uh, Navid Shah. So, uh, as I, I'm sure uh, you're all well aware, certainly if you read HEPTH or if you kind of know the work of your fellow colleagues, there has been kind of a broadening in our understanding of what symmetry constitutes and what it means in, let's say, the last 10 years or so, uh, in part because I think you could fairly say that kind of many well-tread ideas from condensed matter theory have kind of ported to a context of relativistic quantum field theory. This has many kind of subheadings, which include things like higher form symmetry, higher group symmetry, non-invertible symmetry, subsystem symmetry, and so on and so forth, which I, I, I would do justice to. I'm not an expert really on any of these. In fact, I would say that this project I'm going to tell you about was my own personal excuse to learn about the subject. Uh, when I was uh, Lecturing at, at the TASI last year, I was the only person not talking about generalized symmetry. I got back and I was like, I have to know what's happening, see, see what's up. So this is a part of, partly my journey through understanding this. This talk will be entirely about the first of these bullets, which is higher form symmetry. So again, this is going to be the audience that isn't all experts, uh, maybe slightly mixed. Higher form symmetry, uh, if you don't know what it is, it's kind of calling card, is that it acts intrinsically on objects which have extent, okay? So like objects which are on a line or on a surface or a membrane, they don't act on local operators. The kind of textbook picture for symmetry that you're used to are called zero form symmetry, kind of the simplest subcase, which act on say five x, like a scalar field, and you would define its transformations in that natural way. Now by thinking about kind of these more exotic, more subtle symmetries, uh, I think it's fair to say there have been kind of some new perspectives uh, uh, on kind of very classical phenomena, including confinement, anomalies, symmetry breaking, as well as more recently, some kind of forays into, say, kind of inspiring model building uh, approaches. Um, I think it's also fair to say that at present, the kind of very fancy picture of this uh, so-called generalized symmetry, this broadening of our notion of symmetry, hasn't made kind of a, a real like silver bullet magical model building widget that we didn't know before. But it's early times, so in part I wanted to understand the subject to see if there was something that one could directly connect. And in, in part, it's not too surprising we haven't learned like huge new facts about perturbative QFTs uh, in, in relativistic QFTs that are relevant to say standard model or particle physics. The reason ultimately is that we know how to UV complete many of these theories in calculable, you know, normalizable quantum field theories, and we can then just determine everything. So it, it's hard to find miracles when you can compute because you know the. Now that is not true in general for all types of theories. Gravity is a notable exception where we don't know much about it in the extreme UV. We could speculate, but we don't know for certain. Indeed, uh, I mean, is 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 uh, is uh, I think fair to say the kind of vast body of work on generalized symmetry has really been about <coughs> gauge theories or quantum field theories, but uh, relatively little about gravity. There has been some, which I'll mention in a second, but not a huge amount. And this is, at least to me, seems kind of a shame because gravity is a gauge theory, in quotes, in kind of two senses, one which is less precise and one which is more precise. So in the kind of less precise, this is well known, we can think of gravity as a effective field theory for a massive spin two particle which has non-linearly realized diffs. Okay? In the sense that diff redundancy is a gauge symmetry, it's a gauge theory. Okay, that's definitely in quotes, not really a gauge theory in kind of the tech, in a kind of technical sense. But there is a sense in which we can frame gravity in a language that's really close to gauge theory. Right? So uh, we can think of this as gravity as a theory of uh, the local Lorentz group or the gauge Lorentz group. This has many kind of versions and incarnations. Uh, famously, maybe tetrad gravity, if you've heard of it, or the Wielbein formalism. This is kind of like the, the underlying kernel of this. But also it's many variations, which include Palatini, uh, Tetrad Palatini, Plabansky, self dual Plabansky. There's this kind of whole zoology of versions of gravity, which normally seem different, but at least, let's say, broadly speaking, they're all equivalent to Einstein's general relativity, except the kind of auxiliary fields that have been introduced are different. That's the one way of thinking about them. They're basically different ways of re-representing 
ultimately a spin, a, a massless uh, spin to degree of freedom. So in this talk, I'm going to be focused entirely on this kind of picture. Okay, so uh, uh, for for the kind of obvious reason that existing literature was already applied to the notions of, of gauge theories, and this is a way of formulating an outline gauge. <clears throat> now uh, I should say there, there's 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 been ex there's been some work, uh, not a huge body, but some work connecting to gravity, and they kind of come in two two kind of flavors here. <laughs> Much of it has been about the swampland. So what do I mean by that? So usually in this uh, approach, one would think about a good old cute bottom field theory or a gauge theory, and then ask about what types of generalized symmetries it has. Let's say uh, it's higher symmetries or non-invertible symmetries, and then couple that theory to gravity and ask about the fate of those symmetries. So the statement usually is that since uh, swampland would tell us that global symmetries don't exist, it would place some constraint on the quantum field theory once we couple to gravity. That's not what I'll be doing in this talk. I'm not, I'm not talking about QFTs in, with, with gravity, I'm talking about gravity itself. And uh, so that's kind of the main flavor of, I would say, a lot of work. There's been also some uh, recent papers that, that are also very interesting about really honest to goodness gravity, but it's really linearized gravity. So just the linearized graviton, the, essentially the free theory. <clears throat> Again, that's a, a nice story with uh, many, many different groups, including uh, Interpreter Joyce uh, and, and others, and Hull, and, and many other folks who kind of study various versions, but all for linearized gravity. So, no self interaction with gravity. Okay, so what's the plan for today? So, the plan for today is I'm going to start with a gravity in the language of, of, uh, of gauge theory, and I'm just going to carbon copy the logic of everything we have already, well, others have already figured out you know, a decade ago about Yang Mills, but apply it to the effective field theory of gravity. Okay, so, kind of, yes. So this is one quest, uh, yeah. maybe a question slash comment for this slide. Yeah. There's yet, yet another perspective you have adopted to describe uh, higher symmetry in gravity. Yeah. That is why I have ADSC. Yes, I should have mentioned that too. Yeah. Holographically, you could ask, that's a very good point, which is just asking what the holographic dual is. <coughs> um, yeah, excellent point. Um, now, but again, for, for my, our purposes, I'm, I'm interested, it's still distinct from those pictures, in the actual nonlinear graviton interactions. In an effective field theory of gravity, we're kind of crucially, I will be caring about it in an EFT where the dimension and topology of space time is fixed. So, this will actually be pretty important for reasons that will become clearer. When one talks about generalized symmetries, uh, the, the kind of entire picture is framed on thinking about charges and symmetries as operators that link in certain ways, whose topology is crucial. If space time itself has changes in topology, you know, like ha handles are just popping out of existence randomly, that becomes confusing. So here we're going to assume, a, if you like, a weak field expansion of general relativity, uh, where there's a fixed background of fixed dimension and topology, and then gravitons propagating about it. So the usual EFT of gravitons, including nonlinearities of the ground. Okay, so uh, famously, this is an effective field theory like any other EFT, like in chiral perturbation theory. Of course, it's not renormalizable. It means that we should not extrapolate to arbitrary high energies. We can't compute to arbitrary high energies. But nevertheless, if we stick to low energies, we can power count, we normalize, and even in some cases obtain you know, calculable infrared safe, if you like, observables, one of the most famous being the uh, correction to Newton's potential from quantum gravitons, basically like graviton vacuum perturbation. So there exists quantities which at low energies are not poisoned by unfixed counterterms in the full EFT. So this is the theory that we're going to be uh, interested in. Thinking but about. you're including yeah. classical on the energy, so they're not going to be cool. Right? So. No, well, we'll talk about quantum. So, I mean, this is this is what I precisely what I mean by quantum. No, this but, includes quantum. Yeah, quantum, yeah, but classically, do you include, are you in weak field regime or are you including things like black holes? Like, do you, uh, very good. So uh, I will talk about the case where there's black holes, in fact, later on. So indeed, uh, uh, maybe we can put it this way. Yeah, uh, actually, I'll make many connections which will involve ADS Schwarzschild black holes and uh, 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 objects with nut charge and so on. So I'll get to that in a second. Uh, so I will care actually about classical backgrounds, even with quantum corrections. So I, I will litigate that quite deeply in the last third of this talk. Um, good. So that's the framework. What's the upshot of the talk? So the upshot of the talk is by just copying what we already knew from gauge theory to this formulation of gravity, which I'll explain in case you not super familiar with it, there are hidden higher symmetries, uh, perfectly analogous to the ones that we know from gauge theory. Uh, that's maybe not so surprising. What is more surprising and I think kind of interesting is we'll see direct connections to like known words and facts from classical geometry, the classical general relativity. Okay, so like this will connect with things we already knew. So statements about 
uh, symmetry operators and line operators linking, giving you word identities. These, are, these actually have an existing terminology already in GR, and that's one of the points uh, that I want to emphasize. So here's the outline. Here's what I'll uh, start with. I'm going, to talk, I'm going to talk about Maxwell theory just as kind of a warm up. So this is really not for the expert, but for anyone who kind of doesn't really know what a general isometry is, this kind of little uh, preamble will hopefully give you a sense of like what's interesting, why it feels deep, and how it kind of reformulates things you probably knew already in a, in a very elegant way. I'll then go on to Yang Mills theory, and I'm going to go into this in a little bit of detail just because the gravity case will be literally copied. Like you'll just see it's exactly the same. And I'm going to be very explicit, uh, constructing operators uh, quite explicitly. And then I'll conclude with uh, well, uh, comments and, and various future directions. So let's start with Maxwell theory. So, uh, okay, this is the Max, Maxwell action, just an action of a propagating photon. Uh, I'm going to be interested, let's say, in the electric, what's so-called electric one form symmetry. And as I said, these symmetries have the unique property that they don't act on local operators, they act on objects with finite extent. Okay, so what are the charged objects and what are the symmetry transformation operators? So the charged objects are Wilson loops. So this is some Wilson loop I have to find on some contour, uh, shown by C or script C, uh, which is just an integral of this uh, gauge field in, in, in a loop. Okay. That's the object that will be charged. So something which is not local, it's integrated over curve. The, op the operator which, that, which implements the symmetry transformation is supported on a co-dimension two surface I'll be working in 4D, so it's a two-dimensional surface of this integral of star f, which is essentially electrically <laughs> integrated over some surface. Okay, so one of these is kind of mentioned two, the other is uh, and q is quantized because you always think about compact. Uh, I'm going to be considering compact here. Yeah. So the kind of picture that like like 90% of stuff discussions like this start with is a picture where there's uh, one curve which represents, let's say, the contour C, another curve which links around it, which is labeled by S. Here I'm working in a kind of two plus one dimensional picture, so I've suppressed uh, dimension, so this red curve is a surface. And there's some intrinsic sense in which they are topologically linked. There's a linking number between them. Here that linking number is one. But of course, you can imagine a different setup where they're not linked, and then the link number would be zero. So this is the sense in which topology matters. This link number is crucial for uh, this type of picture. And uh, what, what, what are the words topology enter? The words topology enter just because I think of this uh, symmetry operator as something which is intrinsically topological in the following sense. I can take the contour, uh, sorry, the surface S and contract it, okay, slowly change it. And as long as I don't cross any other singularities like the one defined by W, its, op its action on things will be the same. And the kind of picture people usually draw is that it contracts and then pinches off and then turns into a phase which is precisely the word identity of the symmetry acting on this target object. Okay. So again, maybe just to set the stage for like actual mechanics of how this works. When we talk about uh, the word identity, it's actually not very mysterious. We have some operator U, we have some operator W. A and F are conjugates, canonical conjugates. So of course, if you were doing this in canonical formulation, they would have a commutator. A, F is a comma F is one. So you commute them through and you'll get a phase. That's, that's kind of the entire content of this in some sense. Uh, I'll sometimes represent this word identity in one of two ways. So one way is I'll call the path integral version. All that means is the following. Take the path integral and just insert these two functions, the Wilson loop and the symmetry operator. And the statement is that inside the path integral, this has the effect of having some phase, which is controlled by the link number. So if they link, they, you get a non-trivial phase. If they don't link, this is a zero and it's just a one. Okay, so linking is crucial to get some non-trivial uh, action. I'll sometimes state this in a slightly different way, which is a word identity, which is kind of active. I think of this as an, as an object. It's not a local operator. It's a non-local operator because it's integrated over a contour. And this is just, it's rephasing that. You can think of that also in that way. Okay, so again, this is entirely for the uninitiated, uninitiate, but here's one of the kind of amusing features of this, which is that it gives perspectives on different phenomena that you maybe think are distinct, <laughs> but are actually very much connected. So let's think about putting U and W inside the path integral in Maxwell. I now have kind of a choice, if you like. I could think of W as part of E to the IS, the path integral, or I could think of U as part of E to the IS. And obviously, it's like a matter of like nomenclature, who's with who. These are kind of two separate interpretations. Let's take the first interpretation, which is that W is part of the dynamics. 
okay, so to speak, it's part of the action. Well, this would look just like a charged particle world line. Okay? Locally here, this is just a world line propagating forward in time. This is its world line, okay, and of course, very frequently in effective field theory, we we'll even treat particles with this kind of world line picture, except its, it's uh, trajectory is chosen by me, okay, whatever that contour is. Okay. So in this picture, this is a charged particle world line, and you, if you just look at what it is, it's some surface evaluated on a space like slice, is just the electric flux at a fixed time. So it's an innocuous thing you're familiar with, which is electric Gauss law. There's a charged particle, we're measuring the electric Gauss law, if your Gaussian pillbox wraps your particle, then you get a number. If you don't, you get five. Okay? So this is the familiar statement of Gauss law. Now, if you flip things around, you can actually interpret, rather than W being the kind of object in play, you can think of U being the object in play. U is the thing inserted in the path integral. What does it look like? Well, I want to think of it as kind of a dynamical mode, so to speak, although, although it's not dynamical. So I put it in, uh, uh, in the time direction, so it's traversing in time. I pick some other direction z, so it has finite ex uh, spatial extent. What it is is a string on the z-axis which is extruded in time, so it's just a world sheet for an object carrying magnetic flux. So this is a magnetic flux too. And the other object is simply the Aronoff volume phase. Okay? So in other words, uh, this thing, which used to be the charged particle world line, is just measuring, it's something we're measuring in the background of this magnetic flux too. So from this perspective, this kind of unifies two things we normally think of as kind of different. Gauss law and Aronoff bone. In other words, a kind of four-dimensional god-like figure would not be able to distinguish between those two phenomena. This is the kind of picture where it's not teaching us something like super new. We knew these statements, but it unifies in this kind of elegant way. We're going to kind of take this picture where we swap who's the particle, uh, who's who is the charge object, and who's the symmetry operator, kind of continually in this talk, which is why I'm emphasizing this. But this is the kind of uh, uh, <laughs> the kind of thing that happens in the story. This is, as I understand. Now, how would you write down uh, this symmetry? A common question, to, what's, what's the symmetry of the action and so on and so forth? How do you write down a symmetry that doesn't act on local uh, uh, gauge invariant operators, uh, on, on real local observables? Well, uh, here is, here's a trick for it. Okay? So in the literature, this is sometimes called shifting the gauge field by a flat connection, or when it's closed but not exact, and so on and so forth. But here's the moral of it. Okay? Imagine you had a theory and you just did a gauge transformation. It manifestly, a gauge transformation leaves everything invariant. If it's a gauge invariant interval, so that's that's a triviality, that's a redundancy. But let's do something which looks a little bit looks like a gauge transformation, but isn't quite one. Okay. The sense in which it isn't quite one is that the gauge parameter, the, the, the gauge transformation itself, will have some kind of winding or cohomology, which is only measurable if you can kind of probe non-locally. Okay. So in other words, we're going to write down a, essentially a gauge transformation for something which winds as non-trivial uh, uh, non winding. And the, the, the reason why it's invisible to local operators is that local operators aren't sensitive to winding. They only live at one point. So naturally, the only things that can even know about this uh, winding is something which is extended. Yeah, it's kind of the moral of how you can use gauge symmetry as a, tr as a trick. So the statement here is I'm going to do a transformation that looks like a gauge symmetry, but is not one, in a crucial way, where the, the, it's not being a gauge transformation is actually the higher symmetry that I care about. Hyper, I want to be in these hyperconcrete. So imagine literally doing this transformation where I shift A by d phi, where phi is an angular coordinate, and might say cylindrical coordinates. Okay, so you know, naively, if you just saw d phi, you'd say, oh, this is a gauge transformation of d of something. But of course, this is not a proper gauge transformation because integral of the gradient of phi is not zero. You go in a circle. Right? Normally, if I have a gradient of a single valued function, I get rid of a circle, I get zero. But I get two pi because there's winding. In other words, D phi is a solenoidal gauge field configuration. Uh, crucially, if you were sitting at one local point, you wouldn't know anything about that winding, but certain uh, operators which know about the full uh, uh, space encircling the origin will know. And I'm gonna flesh this out explicitly again because Yang knows will be uh, uh, kind of a, a generalization of this, but the point here is that explicitly, if you take the Wilson loop and you shift, you just get that phase. Okay, so this is me acting at the level of fields uh, this transformation. Again, just to be very explicit, imagine I start with pure trivial connection and apply a gauge transformation. This is just d phi written in, let's say, uh, Cartesian coordinates. You can see there's a singularity at the origin. Again, it's not surprising. Angular coordinates, radial polar, polar coordinates have a pole at the origin. There's a singularity. It's not well defined at the origin, which is why we normally excise it. But if I keep it, I keep that point, 
and just compute, let's say, the curvature as a proxy to, to understanding the kind of cohomology, non-trivial cohomology of this, uh, this transformation, what you get is something which is precisely a delta function evaluated at x equals y equals zero. So this is kind of a nice way of thinking about what this transformation does, which is it like produces a defect. This u is not just some innocuous thing, it produces a string-like or a magnetic flux tube-like object upon which we're measuring the aeronaut bone phase as I show you. So uh, this is the kind of story we're going to be doing for Yang Mills and for gravity. Do a gauge, a gauge transformation looking thing, which isn't a gauge transformation because it has winding, and then uh, see what uh, kind of field configurations it induces. Now for gravity, we'll do this and be explicit because the F, as you can imagine, will become curvature. And then we can interpret this in classical geo. So the reason we're kind of getting down on our knees and like actually building these up functions is that I want to do classical general relativity with these objects, and I will later on in this talk. But that's that's the story for um, uh, yeah. So so that's that's the transformation again. So maybe just to be super explicit, uh, here's what I mean by um, that gauge transformation being equivalent to u. U is this operator. It's localized to some two-dimensional surface. You can also write that as a four-dimensional integral over this delta function object, which as I just described, is uh, simply this uh, closed but not exact gauge transformation. So I can rewrite this in the following way, and you can see that the action of u on ETDIS is equivalent to shifting f by dxc. So in other words, inserting u into the path integral is precisely the same as doing this transformation. It's just instructions for shifting a by this amount. Okay? And in doing so, you send w to this phase map w, as I saw that in Okay, so the upshot is that the symmetry operator is topological and furthermore has kind of a physics interpretation as being actual stuff if you want to uh, think about some if you like microscopic stuff. <clears throat> okay, let's talk about Yang Mills theory. The story is identical in spirit, but the technical, uh, there'll be some slight technical differences. So here I'm going to use the first order formulation of Yang Mills theory because we're going to do the same thing for gravity in a bit. This is the famous uh, BF theory, where B is just an auxiliary. F is the usual field strength in terms of the gauge field A. Integrate out B, you just get uh, the usual minus uh, one fourth F squared. Okay, some of the colors. Okay. Uh, and there's a reason we want to use this, the same reason as everyone else uses them, is that in this type of formulation, the fields and their conjugates are very manifest. Okay, in other words, B and F are kind of conjugates. So we kind of know very explicitly who to dump into the operators. As, as I showed you before, the charged operator and the symmetry operator are canonical conjugates, so they commute and give you these phases. So we always want to have this kind of pairing where f is in one and b is in the other. And we're going to see that through that. That's a well known statement. And the, uh, yeah, again, this is just Yang Mills written in a, in a slightly different way. What's the uh, charge operator? So famously, the, 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 the line operator is the non abelian Wilson loop, which is uh, just the uh, uh, path ordered exponential of the non-abelian gauge field integrated over a contour, where I'm taking this trace and I'm doing all the color algebra in some representation row, okay, which I'm, being, I'm not being explicit about here. So row could be fundamental or whatever, whatever, whatever representation you wish to take. Okay. Um, uh, as, as a, a, again, this is a, a famously, the one-form symmetry is something which is valued in the center of the gauge group. So for instance, SUN would be ZN. And this is just the action. Okay? So in terms of the active transformation, W transforms by this, where rho is the center element evaluated in the representation. <clears throat> now, uh, let me kind of motivate partly why this has this interesting center structure. You might, there's always a disjoint, uh, kind of a disconnect when we go from Maxwell to uh, non-abelian. In Maxwell, you probably saw those charges and symmetries were continuous symmetries. So the higher symmetry is a continuous symmetry. Here, alpha is valued in uh, Zg, which is a discrete symmetry. Okay. So there's a, there's I, I, a, I have a historical question. Yes. The, the center symmetry has been known for decades, right? Yeah. Before people were even using the words higher form symmetry. Yeah. Yeah. But then people always do that Wilson loops for charging. Yeah, centers. absolutely. That's why I think even in the literature, people won't even call this just the center symmetry. <laughs> it's only kind of in the modern picture that we kind of like retcon that into like a different statement. But let me motivate the center of symmetry. You could ask why center, like, you know, from a, 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 either, a different on high principle. Well, let's again take the picture that we want to do something that looks like a gauge transformation, 
but has some winding in the gauge parameter. So we'll, it will be something which is invisible to local gauge invariant operators, but visible to operators that have finding extent. So we can just do a gauge transformation like this. This is how it transforms A and B. What does it mean to have it have winding? Well, uh, imagine taking this contour C and just kind of breaking it open, okay, just infinitesimally. So it has two endpoints, P minus and P plus. So the statement of winding, which is analogous to what we saw for uh, a photon for Maxwell, was that we want that if we go in a full revolution, there's a mismatch between P minus and P plus. Literally, the gauge uh, parameter is mismatched between these two, two points. Okay. And as uh, for reasons we'll see in a second, we will need this mismatch between these two points to be valued in the center. And let's see why. The reason why is the following. So let's say there was a mismatch, but you didn't know it was in the center. It was just some element of the group. What happens to this object? Well, we can plug it into the, uh, plug it into the path interval. It's not the path interval. We'll plug it into the, the path ordered exponential. Okay, we get the usual rule, which is that it ends up pulling out of the, the exponent, and we get an omega inverse, an omega. The trace brings them together to give alpha. Okay, so this is the expression. Okay? If alpha was a random group element, some random group element of, of, of the gauge group, then this is the answer, and we can't do anything because alpha doesn't, uh, in general, alpha wouldn't commute with the, uh, the path ordering. Uh, what that would mean is it would actually matter kind of where in the path you insert alpha. So in, in other words, uh, in this picture, kind of picked some place to cut, but I could have picked a different place to cut with some mismatch. It needs to be that no matter where you pinch this thing off, the answer is the same, which forces alpha to be in the center so that you can commute it fully out, so it's essentially a number, and then you're left with rho of alpha. Okay, so from this point of view, in terms of a kind of winding <laughs> uh, gauge transformation, the center valueness is really so that this thing acts topologically. If I couldn't pull alpha out, then the Wilson loop wouldn't transform as the Wilson loop times something. It would transform into just a different object. Can I ask a question there? Yes. So it's clear yeah. that making alpha be in the center is sufficient for that, but is it obvious it's necessary? Uh, I think you could prove it's actually necessary also. Uh, yeah. But I haven't thought about I haven't thought about trying to prove that. But here, yes, I, I, I agree that the argument is stated only says it's sufficient. So it's meant to motivate other existing known statements that the center is the, is the higher center. So I'm just motivating. Let's not consider that first. Okay, we can do the same, uh, we can be very explicit again. So this is just me being hyper explicit. Building a gauge transformation that winds in the angular direction. Okay, this is just the non-abelian analog of what we saw before. Uh, the only kind of point here is that there's some C here, which is some element of the gauge group. Uh, so, so some uh, generator, oh, sorry, generator of the gauge group. And uh, there's some condition that it must exponentiate to one precisely to give this mismatch. So in other words, this is chosen so that the mismatch is center valued. Uh, here in the case of SUN, this is just an element of Z. Yeah, this is me just being explicit. Yeah, it's the same story as before with, the, with uh, Maxwell. We have something which is singular at the origin. We have something which induced, which is, if you like, a world sheet for some magnetic object. But the whole story is still false. OK, good. Uh, again, this is still the same statement. Do a twisted transformation, and you induce a field strength curvature, uh, delta function supported uh, 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 correction of the curvature, which looks precisely like this as the world sheet table object. Um, and this is the operator. Okay, so in fact, uh, I think some versions of this were kind of intimated in some papers by Clay Cordova for like a broader class of so-called non-invertible symmetries. But this is, if you like, the an explicit expression for the non-abelian symmetry operator, the, top, the, the defect operator, symmetry defect operator, in yang mills theory, uh, it's uh, this object, where B is really a field in, 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 uh, in the yang mills Okay, and just like before, we can do the same trick. So if we write U as this object, we can recast it as a delta function integrated over all space. We write this delta function as a gauge transformation, and just like before, we can see that the action of the symmetry operator is nothing more than instructions to do one of these winding gauge functions. Okay, good. So in, yeah. in one case, another way to arrive at the same surface operator would be just to apply another theorem to the yeah. gauge symmetry, yeah. and then charge becomes a surface charge, and one gets... But that looks different from... Yeah, because this isn't continuous. <laughs> right, so, so yeah, in one case, it's, 
I'm not gonna tell the difference between. Yeah, in the U1 case, it's just simpler because you have a, a, a conserved chart. You have a conserved current because it's a continuous symmetry. The kind of intrinsic subtlety here is that you don't have Q. There's no Q to exponentiate because it's not a continuous symmetry. It's a discrete symmetry. So here we've built, uh, if you like, those that we've built the symmetry operator, but there isn't like a local conservation. But I might think, try to do the here the same thing. Also apply just another theorem to mesh symmetry, and then we'll get some surface charges. Right. It looks reminiscent of it, but you have to ask at what point will the center valuedness exactly. Uh, yeah, yeah, point exactly. Value. And I think it's on, on the action of W. Maintaining <gasps> that it's a topological operator will force you to have alpha not be an arbitrary element. That's kind of what I just said. Um, uh, it's, it's a separate constraint. <clears throat> but if you like, this is just another way of saying what other people have already known forever, uh, which is that the center symmetry acts as a high, as a one-form symmetry on Okay, good. So that was all. That's all background. Okay. What we're going to do is copy that and talk about gravity. Again, this is maybe a, another topic that maybe not 100% of everyone is, is knows in the back of their head, which is tetrad Palatini gravity. Let me kind of briefly summarize what it is. But if I had to say it uh, in, in words, essentially, it's the BF formulation of gravity. Right? You can write gravity as a BF theory. When you've heard the word, if you ever heard the word Splavansky gravity, it's BF theory, but for gravity. Okay. Let's see what it is. Okay, so um, there's kind of two separate moves I'm making. So one is the introduction of the local Lorentz group, okay, which is why there are these capital A, capital AB type indices. These are local Lorentz indices, lo local Lorentz vector indices. Uh, so uh, uh, these are like the gauge group. Okay, I'm going to stick to four dimensions here. And I should also say I'm going to, this is an abuse of notation, I'm going to call this the Lorentz group, even though I will switch between Euclidean and Lorentz, depending on the discussion. Okay, so of course it's, it's a Lorentz group in, in, uh, in, in plus minus minus my signature, but if we go to Euclidean, it would just be the group of rotations. But I'm just going to call it the local Lorentz group, so I don't have to keep uh, switching gears. That's the first element, is there's a local gauge group. The second element is that there is, it's a first order formulation. Okay, so uh, we're of course all familiar with the pure metric formulation of gravity. You just put down a metric, you write down the gauge invariant, or diff invariant action. But there are very nice uh, first order formulations like so-called metric affine or Palatini, or tetrad Palatini, where you introduce the connection as a separate degree of freedom than the metric. So tetrad is metric, essentially, connection is some other object. And the idea is that the, uh, the uh, uh, spin connection is an auxiliary. So you can integrate it out, literally integrate it out algebraically. It sets the connection equal to the usual formula of the connection. It's a Levy chain gated connection in terms of the in terms of the uh, metric, and it gives you all the same dynamics. So it's just a way of integrating in something, which makes some of the, the physics uh, more transparent. And again, just to emphasize, the tetrad here is a vector of Lorentz, uh, while the spin connection is an adjoint of Lorentz. So these are anti-symmetric in A and B. You can think of it as boost value. It's valued in boosts. Okay, so the six. Okay, Good. any questions about that? All right. Oh, I should mention one thing, which is, um, Right at the top here, you could say, well, why do I need to say the words tetrad? I like G me nu, I like H me nu, why don't we just deal with that? Uh, again, sometimes things are clear that way, but the point here was to use the gauge theoretic formulation of this to make our lives easier, so we can just copy things we know. Without them, it becomes more confusing. But here's an even better reason, and you'll see why this is needed. I'm going to be intrinsically careful and interested about objects with spin. Okay, if I have a spin half particle, I need to introduce some kind of spin structure anyway. I need to introduce these tetrads. So a pure metric affine, a pure, pure metric is not good enough. And indeed, even in the world we live in, fermions are here, metric's not good enough. Okay, so if you like, uh, to the extent there's not a real substantive difference between tetrad and metric, but in the world we live in, the, the world uses tetrads because we have tetrads. Okay. We'll see very explicitly why this will be important. Here's the action. Okay, not written in maybe the way that's most familiar to most of you, uh, but let me unpack it. So the first term here is just the Einstein-Hilbert action. One on G squared is just the usual one on eight pi G. Okay, so this is Einstein-Hilbert written in uh, form language. The second term is the cosmological constant. Okay, so in case I didn't, uh, I didn't emphasize it before, I will not necessarily be an asymptotically flat space in this discussion. In fact, everything I'll say will be independent of that. Okay, so lambda here is the CC. <clears throat> And uh, yeah, okay, just a matter of algebra to show that this thing is equal to the usual root gr, root gr and this is the, the cc. Okay. Uh, here, uh, r 
which is the curvature associated with the spin connection, is the Riemann curvature. Okay, so it's a two form in space time. There's uh, mu and nu indices that I've suppressed here, and then it also has two uh, Lorentz indices. So this is the full four index object. I've just suppressed some of these indices. Okay, so this is I, this is Einstein Hilbert plus cosmological constant. If you vary the two degrees of freedom, which are the tetrad and the spin connection, you get these two equations. One which is vanishing of torsion, the other is the Einstein field equations, written in maybe a little less familiar, uh, familiar than that. Okay, good. So, so uh, this, is, this is, if you like, you, you just walked in, you could see this is a gauge theory where all the A, B, C, D indices are, are uh, gauge indices. Now we can put it kind of even more strongly in the kind of language of the way people think about higher symmetry by identifying what's known as the Plobansky two form which is a realization that in the action I just wrote, uh, the tetrad kind of shows up in the, in the following combinations in terms of a two-form called B, uh, in addition to its uh, internal Hodge dual star B. Okay, basically, you can take the formulas I just wrote and write them in terms of these B objects. And now this is precisely a BF type structure. So this is the part we're using four dimensions, I guess, is the Plavansky part? Yes, yeah, so here I have used intrinsically uh, Plobansky. There exists Plobansky in higher dimensions, actually, also. So it's, it's not actually crucial. It's just nice because I can kind of put stars easily. But actually, I should say, all these, uh, we didn't do this analysis in our paper, but this exists for a general dimension. You just have more E's, E, which E, which E. Okay, you can put, put, put that into a, into a Plobansky higher form object. So th this whole story has existed for, for ages. But the kind of crucial point is that the B field isn't some just random object. It's naturally the conjugate to the curvature. Just like before, we had B be the conjugate to the field strength. Now it's the conjugate to the Riemann curvature. Um, and the CC is the B squared term. Okay? Now I'll sometimes set lambda to zero, have it be not zero, and so on. Um, you can do other kinds of really fun things, like you could actually integrate out B if there's a cosmological constant. So I just mentioned this because this is a fun thing I learned. Uh, if you have a cosmological constant, um, Ted Jacobson and others later on showed that you could just integrate out B entirely and just be left with a formulation of gravity in, let's say, ADS or DS, which is purely in terms of the spin connection. So it's like purely, it's called spur, pure spin connection formulation, but there's no metric, it's just spin connection. It's a kind of interesting field theories to, to study. Of course, they're not in flat space, so it's hard to compare with things we know, but you can do all kinds of fun things with this, with this kind of optimization. Okay. Now, good. So that, that's just the setup of what, that's what tetrad Palatini is. It's a first order formulation that has intrinsic gauge symmetry, which is the local Lorentz group. Uh, what are the charged objects? So yes. is this just, yes. I should just think of it as a gauge definition for the tetrads? Oh, very good. Yeah, so um, right now I'm just identifying B as E or G, but in the canonical uh, so-called Plabansky formalism, B is a legit just full-on two-form. And it has a constraint which enforces that it's equal to E with G. So uh, the way Plomansky works is B is fully dynamical and it's a constrained dynamical field. Okay. Here I'm just renaming E with G. So I'm not strictly using, I'm not using Plomansky, I'm just using tetrad and writing in this language. But my kind of point here is that uh, the constrained two form is a tetrad. So uh, the, the mechanics of uh, these. Uh, Plomansky are two form gravities that all the degrees of freedom are like naturally two forms and then the tetrad emerges from. But it's yeah. not the proper to the definition, right? One cannot reconstruct. Uh, yes, because it's constrained. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. So I wouldn't call it a field redefinition. Here, though, for me, B is just a renaming of E with G. So I'm still working in Tetra. Yeah. So yeah. none of these field redefinitions have restricted you to the uh, two derivative theory, right? Like, um, you, yeah. like Riemann squared yeah. would play nicely with all of this. Yep. So in fact, I'll get to that. I mean, oh. this is uh, something Yeah. The, the experts will know. but. For these higher symmetries, they're very difficult to spoil because they don't act on local operators. So if you start adding corrections like f cubed, r cubed, r squared, and outside of four dimensions, you're safe. And in other words, you can always end up building some object which is still representing the symmetry. Uh, it, it's, it's kind of the, the good thing and the bad thing for getting higher symmetry to tell you something uh, new about interactions because it doesn't act on local operators. So it's hard to break it. But it doesn't give you selection rules on the operators that exist. So, uh, but yes, uh, I'll get to that also. I'll, I'll talk a bit more about that later. But yeah, higher dimension operators, that's all something we can include here in the category. 
Okay, now what are the charged objects? So as you can see, I, I introduced uh, I have a spin connection, which is, I didn't say this, should be clear, it's like connection, okay? It's the analog of a gauge field, it's in the adjoint. Um, so this is a thing that is very naturally in a holonomy, like literally the holonomy from, uh, from, from relativity. So the charge operators are now going to be the exponential of the spin holonomy along a curve, computed in some spin representation. Okay, so rho is in a spin representation of your Lorentz group. I haven't told you what the Lorentz group is. I'm going to litigate closely the different choices here. Famously, in higher symmetry, it really matters the global structure of your group. You can't be sloppy and just look at the Lie algebra. Global structure matters, so I'll talk about that in a second. Okay, but the point is that uh, rho is valued is, is in some rep of the Lorentz group, and the one from symmetry is the center of the Lorentz group, or whatever appropriate center for G. Yeah, and again, I'll, I'll talk about which, which ones we were interested in uh, in the real world. Uh, and this is the, this is the action. Okay, so if you like, this is the expectation right, based on what we know from the angles. These are definitely the charge operators. Of course, our work was like, what is the conjugate? But given what I've said, it should be kind of obvious what the conjugate, what the U operator should be. We'll get to that in a second. But let me, let me kind of deconstruct capital G here. And there's a number of options. And when we say Lorentz group, we, uh, we uh, could mean many things. For the moment, let me just stick to Euclidean. Okay, I, I should have had a slide. I should have had a slide for Lorentz, but, but let's stick with Euclidean. Okay, there's many uh, 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 gauge groups G, which uh, are kind of locally isomorphic, but are different in terms of their global structure. You may be used to think of SO4 rotations, but uh, as is usual, we have these kind of double cover type situations where we can think about spin four, which is SU2 plus SU2 whose various uh, modding out by Z2 gives us these other groups. Okay? And depending on what you mod out by, you have a different center. Okay, so you should think of a spin four as the group we need if we want our theory to include fermions. Okay? We want fermions living in the SU2 left, SU2 right. So these are like lambda alpha, lambda bar, alpha dot. These are the, the two representations. So you can already see that the center is linked to a notion of kind of fermion parity. Concretely, the action of the center symmetry is a zero form symmetry, as, a, as an honest to goodness local symmetry acting on local operators is actually a spinner parity. For here it's a kind of vector parity, and here it's true. Okay, so it really matters which gauge group the universe chose. Okay. Uh, I, I, I should say that, uh, let me just mention in words the case for Lorentzian signature. This is Euclidean. In Lorentzian signature, we get a spin 3, comma 1, okay, which is SLTC. That still has a center. Okay, that still has a center symmetry, which is Z2. But it gets modded down to SO3, comma 1, which is centerless, and then, and then that's it. So our world, of course, has fermions. So we will have, at least in the actual world we live in, which is Lorentzian, a Z2 center symmetry of SLTs, <clears throat> and just connected to fermion. Okay. And again, I don't have to go through this carefully, but you've already seen the story. Well, what do you want to do? You want to do a gauge transformation, which is a twisted Lorentz transformation. Okay, it's just a uh, boost. Is there a question? Yes. Uh, very good. Yeah, so I, I kind of dropped CPT. Yeah, if you like, uh, in this picture, I assume no connection between the two SU2 factors. You could put it back in if you like and make it chiral, so, uh, or, not, or not chiral. Uh, it's kind of your choice. So, but right now, I'm not going to be modding out by CPT or including it. Uh, um, so for, for me, these, could be, these would be separate factors. Uh, you could ask about the, if you want to impose the Euclidean image of CPT, then it would be genus like that. Uh, uh, good. So this is the Lorentz uh, transformation. Again, I don't, you know, you've already seen these formulas. All by the same logic, we learned that the spin holonomy requires this to be in the center uh, in order to be top okay, So this is all just me constructing the operator. Uh, uh, in constructing the, 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 the local Lorentz boost, which implements a symmetry. Okay, so like hyper explicitly, the statement is you have a charged operator, which is the spin connection, which is secretly the graviton, integrated over a line. Okay, and when you transform it, it transforms under this space, which is valued in the center of the world. <clears throat> okay, uh, as before again, it also has support on a surface, exactly for the same reasons. It's all a carbon copy. Okay, now here's, here's where something interesting happens that isn't in Yangels. Uh, and it's kind of more of an interpre interpretational statement, okay? Which is uh, the defect operator, it's exactly the same as the emails, except I've replaced the adjoint color indices with Lorentz indices. That's all these are, okay? 
And if I just write B in terms of the tetrad, you get this object. And this is, at least when we saw, realized what this object was, is very suggestive, because it definitely looks exactly like an area operator. This is a, this is a co-dimension two integral of metric stuff dotted into some lambda, which is defined uh, by the center element, divided by 4G, uh, 4GN. Okay, this one half is naturally part of that normalization. It's kind of highly suggestive because it looks like area. Okay? But crucially, we know it's not literal area. Why is it not literal area? Because this is a topological operator, which means that you can deform it, blow it up, decrease it in any way, and its effect and its action on things will not change. So it's not actually an area operator, but it has the dimensions of one and looks a little bit like um, Hawking's A over 4G, just has that reminiscence to it. These types of operators actually show up in loop quantum gravity, which is, for clear reasons, they take formulations like Plabansky, equivalent versions of, uh, of general relativity, and try to quantize it. So that's why these kinds of objects actually show up, in addition to the Hahn. Okay. But here we're arriving at this object, if you like, from completely different means and, and from different uh, motivations. Now, uh, again, as before, we can take the symmetry operator rewrite it in terms of this delta function, and again, it becomes a local Lorentz transformation. Again, these are all copies of previous slides. And we see that the action of the symmetry transformation is, again, just instructions to induce a curvature singularity at some point. Okay. Now, before, we had this interpretation of a field strength singularity, so it looked like a magnetic flux tube. Now it's a curvature singularity in Riemann, and uh, it's very now enticing, and I'll tell you what this thing looks like in GR. Right? We just have a formula for R mu nu. We guess what is this thing? What would we call this if we were doing uh, starting from the point of view of general? Okay. So what is the defect? What is the defect corresponding to the symmetry? So it's very easy to see. I mean, R A B is this. This is just me writing a formula from previously. It's a curvature singularity induced on the surface, which has Curvature. So you can reverse engineer the stress tensor for this. Okay, so just use Einstein's equations to determine what like putative uh, stress tensor or source of source of the gravitational field would induce this uh, this correction. And this is what it is. It's not Nambu go to. You you might have expected it to look something like a string world sheet, but it has very strange anti-symmetry properties. Okay. Uh, I won't I won't actually go into the the, the nitty, -gritty, nitty gritty details of this, but this thing. Uh, if you study it, you'll realize it actually has both energy momentum and nut charge. Okay, so it has the analog of magnetic charge in general relativity. And in fact, it has them in equal amounts, so it looks like it's self-dual. Okay, so just like you imagine like a self-dual dion in, in Maxwell, this is kind of that analog, but for an extended object. So it's a string. We didn't want to call it a cosmic string, because a cosmic string only has, uh, uh, only has um, stress energy. It has kind of some um, similarities to this called Meisner string, which is the uh, uh, singularity inside uh, Taub nut. Uh, but it's what it is. We, we call it this because it's kind of intrinsically curved. Yes? Should I think of this as carrying angular momentum in it? Uh, um, maybe deep, deep within its core, yes. Because like this it's is like a, it's, it's a very, yeah, it's, it's something which is lo highly localized. Right. But you're kind of asking, like, what's inside that solenoid? Yeah. And yes, it has I all mean, kinds in, of stuff. In, in other words, okay, so this is in three plus one dimensions. Yeah. If I mod out by the dimension along the string and treat this as some object in two plus one dimensions yes. of gravity, yes. is this some known two plus one D? So is it like a charge spin? Not that, not that we saw. So okay. we actually, uh, um, we're, we're, it could be our own ignorance, because there's a huge body of JIRA literature and solutions that you, you're more aware of than I am. But as far as we could tell when we did the deep dive, we couldn't find literally this object. Okay. Um, so as far as you know, no, but that's subject to some buried paper from like the 80s that maybe does. But the kind of crucial point is it certainly wasn't observed that was related to higher symmetry. Um, so in terms yeah. of singularity for GR, this just kind of usual kind of overflow type singularity you have seen in the curvature. Sorry, say that again? So in, in, in different geometry, we have this overflow type singularities. Yes. We have yeah. data, data function supported curvature. Yeah. This is just exactly yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. But in the context of GR, where we short to write, yeah, it's exactly that. Very good. So what, what is the physics interpretation of the linking though? Okay, so we have a cosmic string and we have a holonomy. There's some kind of word identity that makes them tangle in some discrete topological sense. So in what sense are they these topological objects in gravity? Where here we can get some intuition uh, kind of amusingly from perturbation theory. Okay, so it seems strange that I would say this, 
Well, one very nice thing sometimes is that perturbation theory can illuminate. Uh, and, and this is what I mean by that. So this is a, a classical GR solution, if you like. This is the source. It's very nonlinear, the solution. You have to solve nonlinear Einstein's equations. But we can do that in perturbation theory, which is a, a kind of another thing I've, I've thought about historically, which is uh, not just scattering, but say correlation functions of gravitons as related to, say, things relative to gravitational wave physics. But let me just tell you a fact that I think everyone should know, which is relatively uh, well known, but, but maybe not everyone's heard about it which is that there is a perturbative way to build classical GR solutions, at least certain types of classical solutions. The most kind of famous version of this was a paper by, by Duff uh, called Quantum True Graphs and the Schwarzschild Solution. So this is how you build Schwarzschild without Einstein's equations, uh, 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 without just kind of solving in the, in, the, in the usual way, but perturbatively, okay? So this exercise is to study graviton perturbation theory in flat space. So let's go to flat space. There's no Schwarzschild metric, there's nothing, it's empty. But compute the one point function for the graviton, okay? But in the presence of a massive static source, okay? So this is the one point function of the graviton, and I just have a point mass here. So uh, these are the contributions to the one point function of the graviton in the presence of a static point mass of mass m, you know, just sitting at the orbit. So you could compute literally these flat space Feynman diagrams. These are all in flat space. Nothing is in curved space. These are all well known formulas. You have to do some Fourier transforms, it's not that complicated. But what Duff showed was that you start reconstructing this series, which at least in this calculation was the harmonic gauge metric. Okay, so he like literally, this is of course Newton's potential, we know this, but this is maybe the first non-trivial piece related to einstein infill hoffman correction to Newtonian, uh, Newtonian dynamics. Uh, this is, the, this is uh, uh, actually what's called the post minkowskian expansion in general relativity. But this whole thing resums. Like if you could do every order in G Newton, you just get this function. In fact, a couple weeks ago, the group at Niels Bohr Institute literally did the infinite sum in perturbation theory with flat space diagrams and got the metric. It's kind of interesting type of calculation. But the point is, perturbation theory is a way of reorganizing this classical solution. Okay. Now, it may seem to violate your intuition. I thought Schwarzschild was some big, complicated, non-perturbative blah. Well, it's a little safer than that because Schwarzschild, as G Newton goes to zero, has an analytic expansion. Okay. The point is, it smoothly goes to vacuum as G becomes smaller, G Newton becomes smaller. Now, other types of uh, solutions you might worry about, but here, uh, that is nice. So why, why am I bringing this up? So I'm bringing this up because we can think about the word identity in perturbation theory, okay? And it will be somewhat illuminating and tell us something about what it signifies in gravity. So what's the word identity? I take U and W and I put in the path interval, so that's what this bracket means, and it should come out as some, uh, some some phase, okay? Let's do this calculation order by order in perturbation theory. Now, as you can imagine, there's no finite order in perturbation theory that will give me the right answer because these are all finite coupling, okay? But let's nevertheless organize the calculation in that language. Well, I can think of U and W as both sources for the graviton, right? This is inserted in the path integral. I think I can think of U as sourcing the graviton and W as sourcing the graviton. So hyper explicitly, U is, uh, is just some surface source for U and G, and W is some line localized source for this connection. These are just gravitons. Okay? So I can just now draw the gravitons and connect these diagrams, literally enumerate all the diagrams, and what do you get? So, uh, so this, this line, these should be linked actually, but let me not worry about that, it's hard to draw. This is the line, this is the surface S, this is the contour C, and then we want to just connect gravitons between them. This thing sources gravitons, they can be emitted and absorbed on this side, and we just want to draw every combination. So you can do this, and you can just power count in G Newton. So again, G squared is the analog of the gauge coupling, but it's essentially the coupling chain. Right? There are certain contributions which don't even talk to both sides, like the renormalization of U itself. It's separate renormalization. So it, of course, doesn't care about the word identity, it's just renormalizing the definition of the operator. We have other things that only renormalize W, which again, there's no one to play. And then there's cross pieces. Okay, so in, in fact, there's diagrams that look like this, which go as coupling to the zero. They are dimensionless. Why do we care about them? We care about them because if I have a word identity that is, you know, uh, root of unity to a power of an integer, there's no G Newton in it. I can take G Newton to be two G Newton, half G Newton, it doesn't matter, it's coupling independent. So I care precisely about contributions that are G Newton independent. Okay, I can just enumerate every perturbative piece that comes from that. 
And what you find is it has the form of this kind of many emissions from this and one landing on this uh, landing on this uh, the curve. Precisely, it's meant to mirror this kind of fan structure. You'll notice every one of these diagrams has the property of it being a one-point function sourced by something else. In other words, classical general relativity is competing one-point functions in the presence of, back, uh, of other sources. Similarly, the contribution of diagrams here that I just mentioned is the one-point function for the spin connection in this background. Okay. Now, what is that? Okay. Well, it's it's uh, just give some names to this. So this is the one-point function of the spin connection. This is U. This is that uh, chiral cosmic string object I mentioned. Okay. And this thing is the dimensionless length number. So I actually know a priori that this is the entirety diagrams with any number of gravitons coming off being absorbed is that length number. And what is this in classical general relativity? This is the uh, vacuum expectation value of the spin holonomy in this background. That's all it is. It's like the one-point function for the, for the field in this background. So there's a shortcut to summing all these diagrams, which is to do a classical calculation in general relativity. Just like a shortcut to all those perturbative diagrams is solving for the Schwarzschild solution, a shortcut here is to compute the spin connection in this classical background. Okay. What does it tell us? Um, well, okay, one, one last corollary is that there's other diagrams that look like this, which also scale as g newton. These have to go away, and there's a prediction which is that all the quantum corrections should vanish because the linking number should be renormalized. So modulo counter terms you would absorb through renormalization. Uh, any term like this will not be renormalized. Okay, so this linking number Im imposes non-renormalization theorems. Perturbative non-renormalization theorems in principle check, but it's hard to compute. Maybe we might try, but uh, in general, hard. Uh, what does it mean uh, physically? So what it physically means is that this cosmic string, this chiral cosmic string, is a lot like a regular cosmic string. A regular cosmic string has the property that it induces a conical deficit. And famously, you can measure a conical deficit by computing the holonomy about it. Okay, it's a way of, uh, uh, it, it, it's, a, it's a proxy to putting a spaceship, putting a top in it that has spin, going in a circle and just seeing how, how it moved. That is what the spin connection is computing. Okay, so what I'm saying is the link number is secretly measuring the conical deficit induced by this defect. <clears throat> All right, so we, let's see how this works explicitly in classical GR. It's very easy to see. So let's take flat space. Okay, I'll make things simple. Don't even put a black hole there yet. We'll get there in a second. Just take flat space and then perform this transformation. This is this flat space metric. And then apply this twisted Lorentz boost. You just do this transformation. So what's, what's, what's kind of cool about this is that this, this um, has no effect except to introduce kind of a defect, like a curvature singularity, and a very localized region, which is the surface. Okay. That's, that, that, that's here on the z-axis extruded in time. Okay. But we can now just compute the classical holonomy. So what I mean by that is, like, place that background source and then calculate Einstein's field equations and solve them. And what you get is the metric. You get, so you get the um, spin connection in that background. And you can just integrate it. And you can just check that it's minus 1. Okay, so the way of uh, physically interpreting it is this minus 1 is the uh, top in your spaceship like processing and coming to a, a, I feel like a, a minus 1 flip of itself in rotation after, uh, after encircling the defect that we introduced. <clears throat> So we did this also with explicit calculation of Adia Schwarzschild. So it's kind of too long to write here, but we took an Adia Schwarzschild background. Uh, actually, Adia's Kerr Schwarzschild, I think, is some example. And then we put the defect in. Doing so, we get a spin connection, which is complicated, depends on ADS length, lots of different parameters. But if you just integrate it, you get the same line as well. Okay. I'm just going to draw a picture of, uh, so this is just the Adia Schwarzschild metric. We apply this boost and then compute the whole line. Uh, let me, this is a picture of kind of what, what I'm saying, which is uh, we put a black hole background in. We then performed a gauge transformation that was twisted that induced a string defect that I've chosen to lie like outside here, outside of my spaceship's path, which defines the holonomy content. Okay. And when you compute this, you get some value, but if you move the uh, defect inside the holonomy, you get a relative minus one. So if you like, it's like 
ex you know, like experimentally measurable, quote unquote, because this holonomy is sensitive to whether it's wrapping this up. So the overarching upshot here is that the analog of the topological linking is essentially a conical deficit induced by a cosmic string-like object, which is such a big deficit, it's a minus one. It's like a 180 deficit angle, uh, uh, mathematically, uh, coming from, from, from this. Okay, so we can think of, um, yeah, either way you want to think of this as either the spaceship or that is a spaceship, but it's a uh, conical deficit. <clears throat> So chiral cosmic string world sheet is the source. We can write it down, it's explicit, and then we can give you the holonomy and it exactly. So this is a check if you like of our calculation. Okay, any questions about that? Did you put it inside yeah. the horizon? Yeah, we, so we, 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 we wanted somehow to avoid that because we got a little worried, but it still worked. <laughs> but again, it's, um, let me put it this way. I think you would worry if it crossed the singularity uh, because there's like another defect there, if you like. Uh, the horizon is an artifact, of course, bigger coordinates where it's not even there. So it may be not too surprising that if you just go slightly inwards, it had no effect. But it, it, it works fine inside, as long as you don't hit the curvature or something like that. Yes? So this reminds me of a uh, 2 plus 1 D solution in gravity, or, or equivalently, a, a pathology that happens with uh, cosmic strings with large uh, defect angles, yes. which is if you take them. Time, and, time machines? Yeah, yeah. I was, yes. was going to ask you about the GOT time machine. Yes, yeah, so um, the, 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 the GOT time machine, there's also um, various nut charge, or is a Meissner string? Yeah, it's kind of like the it's like a wick rotation of a cosmic string. They all have possible issues with causality. Right. We totally didn't check it. We we're, of course, aware of it. We even thought about this. It would be interesting to see, like, are these somehow a causal or what? Now, what's crucial, though, is it doesn't, whatever it does, it can't ruin the theory. Why? I can take this object and contract it to, like, as small a point as I want. It's topological. So in some sense, you know, the, this is the kind of GR backstory for it, but its effect can't be something that will, like, make everything a causal. It's really just there as a symmetry transformation. Yeah, I mean, I, I was really asking, is it possible that the, that the GOT time machine, where you get um, closed time-like curves by encircling in rapidly right. moving cosmic string, is, is that somehow like um, a rotation of this, uh, of, of you into like the, right. the TZ plane? Like the, the... As far as we could tell, it wasn't equivalent, because this is a very special chiral combination of cosmic strings and something with that charge. But again, maybe some other even more twisted version exists. But we didn't look at the causality conditions, again, because U is a symmetry transformation operator. We're just kind of giving a, a story for what that defect is. Good. So uh, let me, this is maybe the last technical thing I'll say. Let me talk about explicit breaking. Okay, I didn't mention this at all. But uh, like, like most symmetries, you can take a higher symmetry and even explicitly break it. The way you do that is you add charged particles uh, uh, which essentially screen the Wilson loop. So the idea is, is the kind of picture people draw is you could draw a Wilson loop, you could link with something, but if you have charged particles that can be pair produced and open up the Wilson loops, then you can un unlink things. Okay, so your topology is out the window if you have kind of pair production. Uh, so, so, uh, so, so famously, let's say in Maxwell theory, if you add electrically charged particles to Maxwell, to free Maxwell, it explicitly breaks the one form symmetry. In fact, it does it in a really bizarre way, which violates almost everyone's EFC <coughs> intuitions, which is that that breaking is undetectable below the threshold of the, those massive particles. They, de they are never appear in any order in the derivative expansion. It's very strange, uh, but it's just true. Uh, the same thing is going to happen here for gravity, except the things that will screen are spinning matter fields. So let me, let me show you a picture of what I mean. So imagine I took a Wilson line, but it doesn't close on itself. It has two endpoints. So what I was saying before is that if endpoints could exist, then I could try to wrap this with some, some, some uh, surface, but I can just unroll it. So I can either like, pitch it off here or just unroll it and get a different answer. So there's no symmetry if this thing can have endpoints. But to have endpoints and be gauge invariant, I need to put something here to soak up those indices. <clears throat> so what can we soak it up with? Well, let's say I took the Wilson line in a fermionic representation, spin a half representation. So I told you rho could be whatever you like. Let me take it to be in a spin half representation, either of SL2C or of uh, uh, a spin four, if you want it to be in Euclidean. But the point is you can put down, if you have fermions in your spectrum, you can end these operators. In other words, it's like spin screening. I can just plop down a fermion here and a fermion there, and then I explicitly break this in. <clears throat> and so this is a way, the, the kind of terminology here would be that the spin holonomy is endable or screened. 
Now, that explicitly breaks the symmetry. Uh, that's kind of an amusing connection, possibly, to Swampland. Okay? So in the Swampland setup, people will talk about higher symmetries. They are global symmetries. As I said before, they're not gauge symmetries. They're global symmetries. Global symmetries are friended by quantum gravity. So what happens is, if you have a, a, a higher symmetry in a QFT that's not gauged, then it has to be explicitly broken. To explicitly break it, you need to add charged particles, which gives you various completeness uh, of spectrum statements. So the completeness, uh, spectrum completeness and swampland conjectures are actually related to no global symmetries in this way. The completeness of spectrum is needed to screen the lines that would be uh, exhibiting some kind of exact global symmetry. Something similar happens here, except with fermions. Okay? So what it says is that um, uh, if you're, if it's not gauged, again, if it's not gauged, if you have an honest to goodness global higher symmetry, uh, uh, one form symmetry corresponding to the spinner holonomy, then fermions should exist. Okay, so it's kind of a strange, uh, I mean, they do exist, as usual, it's always like this in swamp land, with gravity conjecture satisfied uh, by the world we live in, but in a putative other world, you could ask uh, what this means for global symmetry. And essentially, the statement is there is a symmetry under which fermionic valued Holonomies, we phase, and you want to break that symmetry. I mean, this is a, like, it's a weird statement because you're assuming that the gauge group is spinfully one. You have to assume, exactly, that's a very good point. So you have to not gauge it. As usual for, for any swampland statement, maybe it's not a global symmetry because you gauged it, right? Uh, maybe one, that's just true, I agree with that. For Maxwell, though, let's maybe take it as an example. If you tried doing that, you could say, let me gauge the electric one form. The magnetic one form will generally be present. So this that, that kind of duality between them. Yeah, that was the next question. Do you have top lines? I'll get to that in a second. That's in my future directions. We don't have it yet. I won't present it here for a reason that I'll mention in a second. Uh, I, I don't think it doesn't exist, but uh, I'll, I'll get there in a second. Okay. Uh, oh, a lot, lot, last thing is that was the spinner holonomy, but I could evaluate this and say the vector holonomy. And it's, it's kind of clear that I can just write down lots of operators, like this <coughs> operator, where O is a scalar. And this is just a statement that the vector holonomy is screened by orbital angular momentum. So just like in Yang Mills theory, adjoint Wilson lines are screened by gluons. Here the vector holonomy is screened by the graph, like orbital angular momentum itself, the intrinsic charges within general. Okay. Oh, so am I, uh, am I going over there? Uh, maybe I'll just mention one last thing about this before concluding here. This actually implies, forget Swampland, this implies a symmetry of the standard model below the neutrino mass, because below the neutrino mass, there's no spinning fields, there's no fermions, there's no fermionic fields, and thus the spinner holonomy exhibits an exact one-form symmetry. Okay, that's in the standard model. This is analogous to the exact one-form symmetry below the electron threshold maturity. Uh, it, it actually, this simple statement really changed my view of symmetries in the standard model, like the common statement that people make, which is that when the Higgs VEV is zero, there's no enhanced symmetry, it's just false. That's not a true statement. There exist higher symmetries that are enhanced at small electric Uh Is that a question? Oh, yeah, or, just curious. What, yes. what did you put it on the manhole that I found that you Oh, um, well, I guess in some sense that would be analogous to just taking the Lorentz group to be to, to, to gauging, like gauging this uh, higher symmetry. So for instance, if you just said SO3 comma one, you can't even include fermion, and it's just not present. So as is usual, if you talk about Yang Mills with PSUN or SUN, it's your choice. <coughs> choose a gauge group that has no center, it's not very interesting. For our universe, we have it because fermions exist. <laughs> so it's definitely not SS become one. The Lorentz group is not SS become one in our universe. <clears throat> okay, let me conclude. Sorry, I'm going a little late. Uh, so we proposed a uh, one form symmetry construction, which is a carbon copy of Ang Mills to gravity. It applies to the EFT of gravity. The symmetry operator is simultaneously an area operator like very reminiscent of Hawking's one on four G area, but also constructs a, a defect, which whose kind of origin in general relativity, we're not, we're not quite sure of, maybe it exists, maybe it doesn't, but it's very strange, kind of exotic. And the link number, okay, the kind of intrinsic feature of linking of objects is the statement of conical deficits, which also link holonomies with string. Uh, let me fly through my future directions. We can go to higher dimensions, we could go to higher curvature corrections, which will work. So these top two things will just work, as is not surprising if you know how this works mechanically. Magnetic charges you would think would be trivial too, but there's an annoying subtlety, which is Hodge star in the theory of gravity introduces metric dependence. 
because the star and the non-star turns one from a form to one which is not a form, because you can't integrate it like one. That annoying subtlety was enough to make us pause, but I don't think it's a deal breaker. We haven't done it. You could, so, so the magnetic case is something we want to do, but haven't, haven't done. You could argue that some swampland type papers by, um, well, by Vafa and, and, and Jacob McNamara, who study cobordism, which is, it's, 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 very, it's very much like the magnetic version of, of gravity that includes topology change. It's kind of this, this, this story, but that's not quite the spirit of your, what you're asking. And we haven't done this construction just because we, we wanted to put a bow on what we had. Um, you can do everything in ADS and DS, as I mentioned. It would be very interesting to study this pure connection theory, which is just gravity described by a gauge boson that's valued in Lorentz. Just, that would be just an interesting field theory to study. Should have all this story hold. Uh, the last two, I think, are maybe the more interesting features. So I didn't talk at all about higher group symmetry, but there's like a more sophisticated, you know, one level up story, where if you have a theory with multiple higher symmetries, uh, for instance, uh, axion Yang Mills, which has both a one form symmetry from the Yang Mills and a two form symmetry from the axion, you get all kinds of interesting fusion rules and mixed anomalies between those higher symmetries, which impose really cool facts that are relevant in some sense to phenomenology. They relate, say, the axion string scale to the, the, the energy to, to the mass of the lightest uh, colored quark. That whole story of having a higher group, I think, will just apply it'll just exactly work here, except for axion graviton, so through the gravitational anomaly, and it will place a bound on the Peche Quinn scale relative to the lightest fermion. Okay, we haven't looked that out, but the mechanics of it seem just obvious that it will work. And last but not least, this is by far the most speculative, is I haven't said anything about phases of gravity. Usually the usefulness of, of W is it's an order parameter for whether the one-form symmetry is spontaneously broken, or explicitly broken, or what, um, or not broken at all. Uh, famously, if it goes as an area law versus perimeter, it tells you whether confinement happened. So one thing that I think just no one has asked, which, which seems puzzling, is what if you just compute the spin holonomy in various gravitational setups? It has a scale. Is it area law? Is it perimeter? And so on. And you already find some interesting things, which is an ADS. It doesn't scale quite with, uh, seems to scale with like an area law. There's some preliminary results where kind of strange scaling depending on your cosmological constant. You could speculate whether that means something about the phases of gravity. Okay, that really embrace the analogies with Young Mills, but it's not even clear what a phase of gravity would mean. It doesn't define, like, what, do you, what, 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 what is there in EFT that this could be describing? Uh, we have speculations, but uh, we don't know yet, but a calculation might have been that. Okay, that's all I want to say. Uh, sorry for going late, and thank you for your time. Usually we say that in gravity, you can only asymptotic observables to really define. Yes. So what existence of the symmetry means in terms of S metrics or CFT correlators right. that think about it? As is. usual, like whenever we have any object which isn't the integral over all of space, it's either a local operator or a line operator, it's actually, strictly speaking, a different variant because you have to pick from right. you have to address it. This is the same issue that you would have if you want to talk about swampland. You're talking about a Wilson loop in a Yang Mills in gravity. What defines the loop? So intrinsically here, we have to imagine defining relational observables. So I, I, we got to the joy of voting about this whole uh, subsector, which is how to dress a quasi-local observable gravitationally. And there's a million ways to do it, which I think are not super explicit, but at least in principle exists, which is to take the, the let's say, a point phi of x and just dress it with a, a either geodesic into the pa past or future with the graviton, or define clocks and rulers and build it this way. I, I believe that this will all be robust just because practically in the FT, we have a no notion of locality defined by the background metric, by the actual coordinates. And in the EFT, I think it should be well defined. Uh, you could worry about the same thing for like LIGO, because like our colleagues at LIGO measure things, they get Nobel Prizes for it, and LIGO is in a place. <laughs> LIGO is not a delocalized integral of all of space time, it's here. So you could ask, wait, what are they measuring? That seems to contradict what Many formal people say about there being no local observables. So how do you square these two things? Practically, I'm sure LIGO measured something. I'm not worried. It has to do with dressing relative to something else. Um, and we're imagining kind of the same, the same construction. Uh, do you think there is, will be some way to formulate it? Let's say I think about ADS gravity. Yes, yes. Is there some CFT language to say what, what this symmetry Well, yeah. Is? So you could always, again, try to take a holographic duel and then just reframe it that way. So as I said, you can do this in ADS. So but you, what, what, what is this? We, did, we, didn't, we, didn't, we haven't tried to figure out what it is, but that would be a very interesting question. Put in ADS, build the operator, and just extract what it could mean in the CFT. And then maybe it maybe has some variant variant meaning, which doesn't uh, 
we'd have intrinsic key. In the right? usual dictionary, the yeah. ADS do all this logical operator and founder will be dynamic of brains. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. for example, the, the description mm -hmm. of the one form symmetry in first year parameters in terms right. of ADS5 have to be ADS5 times 5 in terms of D1. Right. 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 And when we push onto the founder, it becomes the whole operator. Right. So, presumably it's that, but for a different gauge group. <laughs> but we, it's something we want to understand. But the kind of, I don't know, my opinion actually having thought now deeply about uh, gauge invariant observables and gravity is that there's actually very little that's been concretely done to like actually build such objects, especially given the experiments measure them. So that's actually one of our ongoing things is to practically build the dressing and see, 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 see what comes out of it. Yeah. Does anything change if the side of the cosmology of Pratsen is positive? Uh, so in this story, no. So in fact, you can see kind of trivially why. Uh, sorry. Uh, I'll go back here. So I wrote this BF. Sorry, I wrote this BF type structure. Okay. Like you feel like the sign of this will flip, and depending on when you innervate this out, you'll kind of like something that's ghost-like or not ghost-like. That's kind of strange. Okay. But you can see even the mechanics of the symmetry transformation doesn't care because all that matters is that these are conjugate. So in fact, you could put f of b here. You can make this any function of b, and this all still works. So you get even a higher order terms. This is similar to what you can do for Maxwell. For it, Maxwell is b times f and a function of b. When you integrate out b, you get Euler Heisenberg. And that still has a higher symmetry, which is exact. A one form electric one form symmetry, which is exact. So it's exactly the same story. So it doesn't seem to matter for the symmetry. Yeah. So you mentioned about the innovation. Relation to the magnetic defects, where um, there's this corporism, work on the yeah. corporisms, where there's involving the topological change. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, how would you uh, like think about how to incorporate that in this effective filter approach? Very uh, tough. I mean, I would almost say that's because like, you have a fixed background. Yeah, yeah. This is like the op coming from the opposite end. We're working at a fixed background, small graviton fluctuations, and directly non linearly. They are working in the maximal topology changing regime. Uh, so, I don't think you would continuously connect those. Mm -hmm. And they're also very stringy because they need, to know the UV, they need to know lots of things about the UV completion, or some things about the UV completion they understand. So I would view these as disjoint. Uh, something we could connect more directly to is the linearized graviton story. Because that exists, a bunch of continuous one form symmetries, electric and magnetic, were constructed. But I think actually we're doing something slightly different because we have intrinsic fermion ality in play. It's kind of very crucial. And all those stories were with pure metric. So they don't see fermions, they're gone. Uh, maybe if they do it with fermions, they'll be continuously connected. As we know, the continuous one form symmetry of Maxwell doesn't blithely become a continuous one form symmetry of Ray Mills. The interactions actually break every, almost every month. But that's, I think, what's happening. Yeah. Taking some physical data and yeah. trying to see what happens if rather than infinite flows, you just cut it over. Yeah. That'll be the magnet. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's a very good case. Can you, can, what, what object would screen you? We didn't. Tr we, we didn't try that, but that would be very interesting. Yeah, but but it could end on the top line. Sure, exactly. To, to, to derive the magnetically charged object by finding the object that would screen. Uh, we didn't do it, but we should really try to do that. Yeah. It's a good yes. Yeah. Sorry, I was a little confused about this, this gravitational like, cosmic string. First, I mean, how, how do you actually create this thing? And then, and then second, I mean, I was a little confused about the analogy you gave with E and M earlier, like Gauss's law versus like uh, for some one charge versus its you know, some world line, and you can interpret it as like some mm -hmm. uh, you know, magnetic field, some some line defect, right? Mm -hmm. So wait, is, it, is this is this string also like have three dimensions of space, or is this a string also in like a time like direction? Oh, it's a world sheet. So the world sheet is two dimensional. You should think of it as a string, which is say in one on the z axis, which is extruded in time. Okay. So it's a cosmic string, let's say, literally the z-axis, and it's just sitting there static. Mm -hmm. It's the analog of the magnetic flux tube I mentioned right. for Maxwell, for which we're computing the Aaron von Bohm phase. Right. The analog of that is the holotomy, which is the conical deficit of the induced cosmic, uh, cosmic string object. Right, so it's a point-like in physical space. And no, 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 it's string-like. It, it's static moment, it's on the z-axis, it's a string. So it's a string world sheet, so it's oh, a string right. at one time, extruded in time. Right. So it's a two-dimensional world sheet, gotcha, gotcha. one-dimensional object on a slice. So, so how, do you, how do you create this thing? Well, the point is it's created by the operator u. So just like u for Maxwell starts with nothing and it produces it, it's, uh, it's, it's, if you like, it's the same as the electric Gaussian pillbox. You created it by inserting the operator. It's exactly like that. It's, it's created by my insertion of the symmetry operator into the path in the book. 
So in other words, the action of the symmetry is the same as putting that object into the space. Yeah. That's that. What's your question? I mean, uh, like, I guess, how does that physically manifest in like the universe? Um, I mean, how do you create this operator? If it's in your charge. Sorry. Sorry. You would just place that charge contribution down. So I wrote them some stress sensor down. Like right. They just put it down in space, and then it would be cool. Right. The team you knew I wrote. Just right. Right. Down. Sure. So, uh, the lambda that you have